Good evening. Great. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mikal Kurlander. I'm chair of the Graduate Group in Education, which sponsors um, tonight's evening uh, event, the Distinguished Education Speakers Series. And I'm going to, um, in a minute, turn the podium over to my colleague who will introduce today's speaker. Um, but first, I want to um, welcome you on behalf of the Graduate Group in Education, which is a multidisciplinary group of uh, faculty and students across the university doing work in education. We're housed in the School of Education, but we also have colleagues across the social sciences, hard sciences, uh, who care a lot about education. So I just as, uh, first want to see the who's in the room today. So if you're an undergrad here at UC Davis, would you please raise your hand? Great, welcome, wonderful, thanks. Great. Um, how about uh, teacher education students here? Great, great. Um, other PhD MA students who we have here? Great, and uh, faculty across the disciplines? Great. And um, community members from uh, our fellow institutions and schools in the Davis, Sacramento area, if you can raise your hand. <laughs> Thank you, welcome, welcome to this campus. I also want to uh, extend a warm welcome to Provost Hexter, who's also joining us here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Professor Steve Athanasis, who will do the introduction. Thank you. Uh, today, uh, today's event is co-hosted by my colleague, Professor Danny Martinez, and and I. The two of us have uh, planned the day, and uh, Danny asked me to give the introduction. But first, let me just introduce Danny, who's been the co-host for the <laughs> events today. Thank you, Danny. So. Um, I'm really happy to welcome you today to today's talk by Professor Maisha Wynn. Professor Wynn hails from Northern California, where she earned her BA in English from UC Davis. With, <laughs> with, a, with a minor in African American Studies, and her teaching credential from Sac State in English. She taught K-12 in Northern California, then earned her MA from Stanford and her PhD from UC Berkeley, both degrees in language, literacy, and culture. After completing a postdoc at Teachers College, Columbia University, Maisha took a position on the faculty at Emory University in Atlanta where she earned tenure. Since 2012, she's been on the faculty of curriculum and instruction at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she now is the Susan J. Kelmer Distinguished Chair of Teacher Education. Maisha has developed an exceptionally productive research program publishing a number of books and many articles in many top-tier research journals, among others, Urban Education Review of Research and Ed, Harvard Educational Review, Anthropology and Education Quarterly, Research in the Teaching of English, Written, written Communication, etc. And she received two early career awards, uh, from one from the American Educational Research Association, Division K in teaching and teacher education, and the other from the National Conference on Research in Language and Literacy. She currently holds a really exciting William T. Grant Foundation Fellowship, which is an extremely competitive fellowship, in which she's exploring in greater depth groups that are featuring restorative justice, as she seeks to envision applications of such work to education and teacher education. So across her work, Maisha seeks to understand the literate lives of adults and youth from especially African American and Latino communities. In her many projects, she has asked, where do literacies occur, particularly for black and brown youth? What forms do they take? What purposes do they serve? When they are powerful, how might features of those literacy events and sites be explored for their possibilities as schooling opportunities and activities. I've had the pleasure of following Maisha's exceptional career since her PhD studies. At our first meeting, at, which was at a conference at UC Berkeley, already she emerged, even in her doctoral studies, as a fresh voice with deep commitments and very new perspectives. In her dissertation research, she was studying poetry and spoken word performance in coffee houses in Northern California. 
And here she was drawn to study what was happening in black-owned and black-operated bookstores and cafes in Northern California that were eateries by day and <laughs> cultural centers by night. <laughs> Maisha characterized these spaces as African diaspora participatory literacy communities. And she found in those sites that orality and literacy, contrary to much of the literature, were really not distinct but were on a continuum, and that the boundaries between speaker and audience in these spaces were blurred. In her first book, Maisha documented poetry and spoken word in a program in a New York school setting, and the book that came out of that was called Writing and Rhythm, Spoken Word Poetry in Urban Classrooms. Her second book was particularly ambitious where she used both historical and ethnographic methods to track the development of black literate lives in the US. So when I think of Maisha's work, I think across her work of several defining characteristics. First, careful documentation with ethnographic methods. Second, historicizing the literacy practices. Third, situating these practices within very rich and integrated bodies of literature. And fourth, rigorous analysis. So as just one example, she uh, grew interested in the literacy practices of girls entangled in the juvenile justice system. And in one study, and I just want to highlight this one because it, I think it's particularly exciting, it's called The Politics of Desire and Possibility in Urban Playwriting, Rereading and Rewriting the Script. There are many things to admire about this particular article. I was so impressed when I read it. Um, first, she dignifies the experiences of these young women between ages of 14 and 17. Over a five-year period, she collects their writing, short play scripts, and then she has the audacity to try to analyze themes across 169 scripts. That is a huge undertaking. And how does one do that and still preserve the dignity of each voice? And what I see in Maisha's work constantly is this commitment to this rigorous cross-cutting analysis and preserving the voices of the individuals within. Her work on restorative justice very recently is, I think, very promising. And today, we are going to hear her speak on justice on both sides toward a restorative justice discourse in schools. So let's give a warm welcome to Professor Maisha Wynn. Wow. <laughs> that was an introduction. Thank you. Oh my goodness. He knew more about my work than I do. That was great. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, Provost Hexter, thank you for having me. Uh, Dean Levine, the School of Education faculty uh, who I had a chance to meet with and build with today, had an incredible time with you today. Thank you for your generosity. I know what is packed in your day, so for you to take time means a lot to me. Um, the graduate students and the undergrads who came and spent time with me today in the School of Education. It was incredible. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your um, presence and being so engaged intellectually in the conversation. And you know, there are always sort of these behind the scenes people who do so much and they don't always get acknowledged, but I really would be greatly remiss if I did not acknowledge Cindy Smith, who helped get me here, who you know got me a place to lay my head, and she has just been so generous. I was just telling the dean that on Friday I received an email from her saying, I know you're traveling this weekend, here's my cell phone in case something comes up. So thank you so much, Cindy, for everything that you did to get me here. Um, UC Davis is my alma mater. Um, so it feels really good to be here. This, these are, this is sacred ground for me. Um, the English department and the African American Studies departments uh, gave me a space to find my voice, especially African American Studies. Uh, my brother uh, also is uh, an alum of UC Davis from the History Department. My father was a lecturer here in the late 60s, early 70s. And you know, a lot of children have fond memories of uh, playing on playgrounds and going to amusement parks, but a lot of my memories were actually on this campus. My parents uh, spent a lot of time on this campus and brought us here. Black Family Day, 
Whole Earth Festival. Mm -hmm. I was here, Whole Earth Festival, this year. My husband asked me what I wanted for Mother's Day. I said, I want to go to the Whole Earth Festival. And we were right out there hula hooping. I hope you didn't see me. <laughs> um, but I think for first generation college students, my parents really wanted to demystify the university. And they really wanted to make it a place where we were comfortable. And I'm so grateful to them for doing that. So I dedicate um, this talk today to them, to James and Cheryl Fisher. Justice on both sides. As on so many mornings, when I was a participant observer of restorative justice practices at JFK High School in a small Midwestern city, I stopped to listen when an administrator read the announcements over the loudspeaker. These were always followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, which caused me to briefly harken back to my, old, my own days as a student standing with right hand over heart reciting the words with liberty and justice for all, which had become mere ritual without ceremony and felt more like a disruption to the flow of the class than something worthy of my full attention. After all, no one took time to explicate this script we had duly memorized, nor did we interrogate words such as liberty or justice in the way I would eventually grapple with them as a classroom teacher and later as a scholar. On this particular day at JFK, I resisted my natural inclination to tune out the words and heard an administrator offer a prelude to the pledge, and I'm quoting the administrator. We live in a nation of freedom. Therefore, participation in the Pledge of Allegiance is voluntary. This startled me. Did the announcer always make this statement before the pledge? I asked several teachers and students in the building if this was new. They assured me that the same statement was made every single day. After spending most of my time in urban public schools more focused on controlling the minds, bodies, and voices of children and youth, especially black, Latino, and American Indian, I marveled that a school community would invite students to be agentive in their participation of the pledge. I wondered if school communities could create a culture that values student agency when it comes to democratic engagement, justice, and citizenship, as well as the role of language in practicing justice in school communities. In what ways, if any, could changing from zero tolerance or punitive discourses to using restorative justice discourse create a school's capacity for true justice? In 1990, Howard Zare challenged Americans, specifically those who considered themselves to be Christian, to rethink their orientation toward crime and punishment. According to Zare, this requires that people interrogate the usual questions asked when a crime is committed. What laws have been broken? Who did it? And what do they deserve? Instead, we should imagine questions that consider the human lives impacted by the harm in order to repair the harm. Quite simply, restorative justice is a paradigm shift. Rather than viewing justice as punishment, restorative justice requires wrongdoing to be put right by addressing the needs of the persons who experienced harm. While Zara's work is not new, indigenous communities in Canada and New Zealand have long practiced forms of restorative justice. You have an amazing scholar here, Beth Rose Middleton in Native American Studies, who was uh, lovely in helping me locate resources in terms of indigenous scholarship around the origins of restorative justice. So I really want to give her credit for that work. Um, but Zare's conceptual mapping of harm has become a, the theoretical framework for restorative justice as we know it, as it's practiced now. As the field has grown, there has been more of an effort to not only consider the needs of those who were harmed, but also those who caused harm. Like many theories, concepts, and practices, restorative justice has been adopted by some US public schools. I'm sure many of you know that already. As a response to the disproportionate numbers of black and Latino students being suspended and expelled beginning as early as preschool. However, very little scholarship has examined how restorative justice can change language, cultures, and mindsets in school communities, and even less that offers theoretically sound models for how to conceptualize and incorporate restorative justice as a tool for seeking and achieving justice for all students. It is irresponsible to discuss restorative justice in school settings without considering the black freedom struggle than, and the struggle for poor and oppressed peoples in the United States. 
I have argued that the black arts and black power movements offer powerful models of literacy in the active pursuit of equality. The black freedom struggle, or the black power movement, which is often situated in the 1960s and 1970s, people debate these dates all the time, is often portrayed as a separate, distinct, and adversarial cousin to the civil rights movement. Architects of the black power movement argued that without first liberating poor and oppressed people in the United States, not all citizens would fully experience the concept of democracy or liber liberty and justice for all. This barrier to equitable access to justice is currently being debated again in the United States with the intensified policing, brutality, and outright lethal violence against black and or marginalized people in communities, in our schools, and the juvenile and criminal justice context, as evidenced in movements such as I Stand with Ahmed, Black Lives Matter, and Say Her Name. Education organizations have offered statements, as for example, from the American Educational Research Association about the mass murder of worshipers at the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, and from the National Council on Teachers of English and College Composition on Communication Black Caucus affirming that black lives do indeed matter. The latter posits that teachers, especially writing and composition teachers, must grapple with these tensions through their pedagogical practices. In a stirring letter to his son, cited in the NCTE 3C's Black Caucus statement, journalist Tanisi Coates attempts to address the current climate of violence toward and murders of black children and youth in a dialogue about the history of black bodies in America. Coates asserts that his work is guided by, and I'm quoting him here, the question of how one should live within the black body within a country lost in the dream, end of quote. It is Coates' assessment of the roles that schools play in this disembodiment that I find particularly compelling when thinking about how restorative justice in schools might redress this problem experienced by so many of our children. Coates writes, and I'm quoting him again here, the world had no time for the childhoods of black boys and girls. How could schools? Algebra, biology, and English were not subjects so much as opportunities to better discipline the body. He goes on to say, I was a curious boy, but the schools were not concerned with curiosity. They were concerned with compliance, end of quote. This notion of compliance versus fostering curiosity has been referred to by my colleague Garrett Duncan as urban pedagogies. That is, schools that primarily serve black, Latino, and indigenous working class or working poor youth and their families sacrifice intellectual rigor for the desire to manage and control these, the bodies of these children. And of course, Patricia says the minds as well in her work. Restorative justice, then, is an invitation to maintain academic rigor. It's an invitation to maintain academic rigor, while also building relationships through consensus building exercises that provide agentive opportunities for students and teachers to practice justice. Through data I analyzed for a case study of one high school's movement to implement restorative justice located in Madison, Wisconsin, I argue that the word justice must be kept intact to provide a historical mapping of oppression, miseducation, and inequality in the United States public schools. So right now we're hearing a lot of talk around restorative conversations, restorative practices, and I keep seeing that word justice being omitted. We keep dropping justice, and I would argue that we can't lose sight of the word justice. That is the impetus and the reason why we're doing this work. Scholars, especially those who work in, edu in teacher education, must do what Chris Gutierrez calls historicize their own lives as well as support pre-service teachers in historicizing theirs as they prepare to work with youth who have both experienced and caused harm. Um, and while I continue to view justice as a form of, uh, of balance, I believe this cannot be achieved without coming to terms with history. I recently had an opportunity to see uh, Brian Stevenson, the author of Just Mercy. Uh, he was our campus, uh, the book was our campus read this year. Um, and he accepted a social justice award um, from the National Council on Crime and Delinquency in Madison. And one of the things that he is starting to do is he, he said the 
next phase of his work, and I want to quote him here, is uh, to con help people start confronting history. And he went on to say that we are all diseased and we're carrying this disease and we must talk about it. So he sees that as the next part of this work that he's doing in juvenile and criminal justice. Children and youth need the guidance of adult allies engaged in restorative justice practices in schools who have opportunities to embed their work in the historical framing of freedom and citizenship that precede them. Philosopher and prison abolitionist Angela Davis asserts, and I'm quoting her, histories never leave us for some inaccessible place. They are a part of us, they inhabit us, and we inhabit them even when we are not aware of this relationship to history. End of quote. It is imperative that teacher educators prepare teachers across grade levels and content areas to confront these histories and take them to task in culturally relevant and what Django Paris calls culturally sustaining ways of classrooms in classrooms and school communities. Restorative justice is an opportunity to do this work collectively and to address the larger wrongdoings in education. Restorative justice cannot be introduced to teachers and staff as another best practice or program. While acknowledging its indigenous lineage, restorative justice must also be historicized through a racial justice orientation that confronts the mass incarceration and violence against black and brown people in the United States. This paradigm shift can support efforts to reduce racial disparities. However, I have to agree with my friend and colleague Rita Alfred of the Restorative Justice Training Institute in Oakland when she says, restorative justice is not solely reducing racial disparities. The latter will happen because of the former. It's about the relationships. Throughout my scholarship, I have examined the link between literacy and citizenship by asking how providing opportunities for children and youth to access critical literacies can support their efforts to build literate identities. In other words, offering spaces where educators can cultivate relationships among students around reading, writing, speaking, performing, and exchanging work. It is through these literate identities that children and youth view themselves as worthy and capable. I found this to be especially true for black and Latino students in underserved schools whose identities were often defined in monolithic ways by the schools. I would further argue that schools must exchange the achievement gap discourse for what my colleague Gloria Ladson Billings more accurately describes as the education debt discourse that explains this notion of a two-tiered idea of citizenship in the United States that often makes education, equal, educational equality difficult to attain. And I'm quoting Angela Davis here. As we all know, the term civil rights refers to the rights of citizens, of all citizens. But because of the very nature of citizenship in the United States, has, and that it's always been troubled by the refusal to grant citizenship to subordinate groups, indigenous people, African slaves, women of all racial and economic backgrounds, we tend to think of some people as model citizens, right? As archetypal citizens those whose civil rights are never placed in question, the quintessential citizens, and others as having to wage struggles for the right to be regarded as citizens. And some undocumented immigrants or quote unquote suspected undocumented immigrants along with ex-felons or quote unquote suspected ex-felons are beyond the reach of citizenship altogether, end of quote. In the criminal and juvenile justice context, restorative justice begins with the needs of the person who experienced the harm with a straightforward protocol. Who has been hurt? What are their needs? And whose obligations are these? School contexts create tensions in this, in this model because many students who cause harm have experienced harm themselves in or outside of school. While students who cause harm still have the responsibility to repair that harm, Addressing inequalities across domains, and uh, Prudence Carter and Sean Reardon offer a beautiful framework for addressing inequality in education research. Looking at domains such as socioeconomic, health domains, political and sociocultural, and beginning with the notion of who gets counted as worthy and deserving, and thus receives the title of citizen, must be the major thrust of this work. Restorative justice then is a move toward what Robin D.G. Kelly calls collective freedom. Robin D.G. Kelly argues that a collective freedom is quote unquote more expansive and radical than the freedoms that scholars like myself have argued come with being critically literate or being able to read, write, think, interrogate, and grapple with text. And while I continue to believe 
that the ability to be agentive in literate practices is critical for youth, as evidenced by my ethnographic work with student poets in the Bronx in the Power Writers class and student artists in the Girl Time program who pen plays about their lives before, during, or after incarceration, I also learned that children and youth need so much more including high quality education, housing, and the ability to live the lives that they desire and deserve. Schools can do some of this work, and I believe that this work can be done and achieved in restorative justice, peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peace building circles. Elsewhere, I argue that circles in the context of restorative justice constitute a third space where tensions and contradictions are utilized to seek individual and collective transformation in a, the way that youth view themselves and each other. And I also would like to add in the ways in which teachers view themselves and students and teachers view their relationships with each other. With the guide of a facilitator, circle participants are led through a series of activities and questions that begin to unpack who they are and why they are in that particular space at that particular time. Using a talking piece as a symbolic reminder that there is a time to talk and perhaps most importantly a time to listen, everyone has an opportunity to respond to the questions posed by the facilitator. Circles can be fluid in that they are created to fit the needs of the stakeholders, thus providing opportunities for what Kelly refers to as collective striving for real democracy. Restorative justice circles have the potential to be change labs where people are transformed through a participatory process that provides opportunities for people to learn more about the lives they have disregarded or even held in contempt. So how did I start asking these questions and how did I get here? Uh, beginning in 2006, uh, and Steve referenced this in his introduction, I embarked on a five-year multi-sided ethnography in regional youth detention centers and youth detention centers in the urban southeast. So regional youth detention centers are these transitional spaces where children, these are jails for children. I just want to make sure we understand these are jails for children. And they're transitional spaces where children are held until they have some sort of court proceeding and they know if they're going to go to a YDC or a youth detention center to actually serve time. Of course, sometimes what happens, and we've seen this a lot in California, is children get held there. They might go in for something that happened when they were 14, and it, they might be 17 before they even have a proper court proceeding to understand what happened and get to the bottom of this. So as part of uh, the mission of this program, um, I worked with this ensemble of women who were committed to, com um, to producing, directing, and supporting plays written by, for, and about women. And as part of their mission, they began working with incarcerated girls in these RYDCs and YDCs. So they were really tense places, especially the RYDCs where girls didn't really know if they were going to go home, if they were going to go serve more time, if they were going to go to a group home, if they were going to go into foster care. It was, it was very touch and go. Um, one of the, so, oh, let me move here. Um, as I learned more about the girls who experienced incarceration, who I refer to as student artists throughout my work, I learned more about their experiences with schools, jails, isolation, and punishment. I learned about Nia, who, like so many other youth, woke up and expected to go to school and return home that afternoon. However, after getting in a fight with a boy, who accused her of, quote unquote, turning his sister gay. She was taken into custody by police after being searched by male security guards at her school. This was happening a lot to queer girls who were in the detention centers. Um, they were being punished for not fitting into heteronormative norms of what people thought girls should be. So these male security guards are handling her in a way that's very rough. They're, they've searched her at the school. And they took her to a, an RYDC in Macon, Georgia, some 90 minutes away from her home in Atlanta. At no point was she allowed to call her mother until she was already detained in Macon. I also met Sanaa, whose play Ride or Die was immensely popular with her peers and an incredible resource for teaching artists who were unfamiliar with the aspects of fierce loyalty that girls engaged in as a means of building and maintaining relationships that were essential to their survival. I learned that in spite of the fact that Sanaa was a thoughtful writer with a keen interest in acting, her only extracurricular option at her high school serving working class and working poor African American students was junior ROTC. No drama club, no language clubs, no theater. Junior ROTC was it. I also got to know Jada over the course of three years. 
a loving mother of two boys who could not navigate the, so the social service institutions to find adequate housing for herself and her sons. <coughs> Jada challenged the practice of routinely punishing girls for running away and from home and school by asserting that onlookers must ask, what are the, these girls running away from? And what are they running toward? And it was Jada who also taught me that while the Girl Time program made her feel, and I'm quoting her, like she was up under a whole nother sky, end of quote, that providing student artists with a place to read, write, think, question, and perform, no matter how powerful, was not enough to address the inequalities in education, housing, health care, workforce, and the juvenile and criminal justice systems that they had to navigate daily. What systems are in place to support these girls and their peers? And how can communities and schools respond to their needs in ways that are more relational and less punitive? What role or what roles can communities play and what role or what roles can schools play? As a teacher educator, I wondered how teacher preparation could address issues of mass incarceration that impact children and youth. And while girl time practiced restorative justice principles, including accountability and consensus building, we did not have the language or the formal training in restorative justice practices. And as a teacher educator, I encouraged, I found myself encouraging student teachers to build relationships with their students. However, I didn't have a formal structure for what this looked like, what it sounded like, and what it felt like until I began to examine restorative justice in school and community contexts. My experiences in the field thus far tell me that it might be possible, it might be possible for restorative justice circle processes, that is using the circle structure in deliberate ways to engage those who were harmed and those who caused harm about the origins of the conflict and to seek a solution to support students and staff in disrupting labels that sort and isolate particular children and youth. In restorative justice circles, participants have an opportunity to crea create boundary-crossing social networks through telling and exchanging personal narratives that humanize lives. I believe that there are many cities and regions where one could ask these questions, and Northern California is a very, very rich site for this work. Um, obviously, there's a lot of work happening in Sacramento City Unified, San Juan Unified. Um, there's a great deal of work being done throughout the Bay Area in Oakland. And certainly, in my research in the Southeast and the Northeast and the West Coast has demonstrated that. While Madison, Wisconsin, the site for this particular study may not resonate as a likely candidate for addressing inequalities in education, the Annie E. Casey Foundation's Race to Results report ranked Wisconsin as the worst state in which to raise African American children. Based on an index, the foundation developed that, quote, compares how children are progressing on key milestones across racial and ethnic groups at the national and state levels, end of quote. By comparison, Wisconsin is one of the more ideal states in which to raise white children as evidenced by its number 10 ranking. For Latino and Asian children, Wisconsin ranked 17th and 37th, respectively. A recent publication by the Wisconsin Council on Children and Families reported that Dane County, containing Madison, has 8,804 black children. And in 2011, more than half of these children, 54%, lived in poverty. Uh, my partner, Tori Wynn, is one of the co-authors on this report. And his team, when they put this report out, it changed the conversation in Dane County that housed houses Madison. Madison really enjoyed thinking about itself as being this liberal bastion in the Midwest. And it was really interesting how now everybody is talking about racial disparities and talking about race to equity. I also learned from him and some of the new data that they've collected that in Dane County, um, the main, for the primary place for police contact, the first contact that African American males have with police, the first place are the schools. The second place is the, are the bus transfer points, the city bus transfer points that get them to school and get them home. During the 2010-2011 academic year, 21% of the black students in Dane County were suspended from school, uh, per, compared to 2.3% of white students. And in the same academic year, 50% of African American students in the Madison Metropolitan School District, I'll be saying MMSD, I'm talking about Madison Metropolitan School District, did not graduate with a regular or a traditional four-year diploma compared to only 16% of white students. 
MMSD's graduation rate for African American students was worse than the state average. In 2010, black youth were arrested six times as often as white youth, and according to the county's juvenile court administrator, many of these incidents began in schools. I met the juvenile court administrator when I first moved to Madison. I was participating in the disproportionate minority contact group, their DMC group. And I asked him, I said, so where do you primarily get the kids who are in your detention center from? And he said, the schools. He said, 90 plus percent. He said, we would probably be empty had we not received referrals from the schools. In light of these bleak statistics, I find it compelling that MMSD, through its new behavior education plan, has incorporated sustainable restorative justice practices in some of its schools. To this end, MMSD has formed a unique partnership with a nonprofit agency that provides technical assistance for implementing restorative justice in schools. For one year, I was a participant observer in restorative justice practices at JFK, that's a pseudonym, JFK High School in Madison. As a participant observer, I was able to participate in circle keeper meetings and trainings for students and administrative staff, including the principal, assistant principals, the dean of athletics, the sports coaches, social workers, school counselors, and psychologists. I was also invited to participate I was also invited to participate in other activities that school personnel believed informed the work around restorative justice, such as their peer counseling training for rising juniors and uh, to mentor freshmen and school-wide team building initiatives. I was also invited to participate in what the district refers to as restorative conversations and circles of support around individual students. JFK was considered one of the more diverse uh, schools, high schools in the city, with 9.4% um, of students identifying as Asian, 20% of their students identifying as black, 17.9% of their students identifying as Latino, and 45.3% of their students identifying as white, um, and 6.6% uh, uh, identifying as two or more races. During the 2014-2015 academic year, JFK increased its graduation rate for African American students from 60% to 70%, which was over the count, the district's average. Um, and when I asked the administrators about this work, they were not celebrating. They said that we still have a lot of work to go. So that's the kind of place that this is. JFK was located in a working class neighborhood and several staff members grew up in the neighborhood and were JFK alumni. School personnel considered their school and community to be a special corner of the city known for its competitive university and popular sports program. In some ways, they acknowledge an otherworldly ethos in their school community in that they chose to confront race and inequality overtly as opposed to embracing the popular narrative that this city did not have the same issues around racism and classism as larger urban cities. Another distinguishing feature of JFK's story of reimagining school discipline was that the school resource officer, that's the police officer that's housed in the school, the SRO, Officer Gold, introduced the school to restorative justice, which he became familiar with through community policing in a working class, working poor neighborhood in the city. When Officer Gold started to work at JFK, he knew many of the African American youth at the school as well as their families. When he witnessed struggles between these young people and teachers or staff persons, Officer Gold focused on ways on, on how to create systems of support to address the problems as opposed to administering punishment and furthering police action. If we have SROs in our schools, this is the kind of work that we want them to be doing, right? We want them to be supporting us and keeping our children in the school and engaged. So he brought these community policing techniques and restorative justice was one of them to the school. That's a very unique, um, I think, story in a lot of the schools. Officer Gold expressed to the administration that they needed training in this thing called restorative justice. No one had heard about it before he came, and they heeded his message. A school social worker and a student engagement coordinator partnered with Officer Gold to find ways to create a restorative justice culture. So who are these student circle keepers that they, they trained at the school? One of the things that I think is really interesting, and this is a whole different paper, so I, I won't talk about it here, but um, the student circle keepers were African-American males, Latino males, African-American females, white females. None of the student circle keepers trained at JFK were white male students. And I think that that's really interesting. And I'm not, I can't really go into that here, but I think it's, um, I think we have to think about restorative justice as being something for all young people to be engaged in and that if we are going to use it for these change labs and 
boundary crossing social network that everyone has to be involved. And I think a lot of times when we import or ex import things into education, like restorative justice, we think it's just for the brown kids. We think it's just for a particular group. It's for everybody. It's not going to work until we see the value in it working for every single student. So that's something that I wanted to take note of. In this ethnographic case study of one high school community grappling with racial disparities in school discipline policies and practices, I wanted to learn how students and key personnel employ a restorative justice discourse or words, concepts, and ideas that underscore building and repairing relationships and creating consensus as well as valuing clear communication. Using talk and restorative conversations and restorative justice practices and, as, and interviews as my unit of analysis, I wanted to learn how participation in restorative justice circle keeper training and or participation in circles transform how students conceptualize justice, freedom, and equality in schools. As I continue this inquiry, I am looking for what ways, if any, a change in discourse impacts their observed practices in addition to their self-reported practices. And in the larger study, and we haven't analyzed this data yet, we're also, we've also interviewed key personnel at the school who have been involved in restorative justice, but really most of the restorative justice work is done by the students. <coughs> Using discourse analysis tools and more specifically building tasks, I focus on what James G. refers to as politics in his framework for analyzing talk. According to G., politics refers to, and I'm quoting him here, any situation where the distribution of social goods is at stake, end of quote. For example, in order to analyze student circle keeper talk around justice and restorative justice, I transcribed interviews and interrogated these texts with the guiding question, and I'm quoting him again, what perspective on social goods is this piece of language communicating? I.e., what is being communicated as to what is taken to be normal, right, good, correct, proper, appropriate, valuable, the way things are, the way things ought to be, high status, low status, like me or not like me, and so forth. And here I argue that the practice of both sides being heard in restorative justice circles, as well as an ethos of equality, count as social goods for the student circle keepers in my study. For the purpose of this talk, I focus on the language of students who were trained as circle keepers. And ultimately, I argue that training students as restorative justice circle keepers not only creates possibilities to transform language, but also transform lives by creating opportunities for students to practice justice. And definitions may seem like a mundane beginning. However, I wanted to understand how members of the school community conceptualize justice and restorative justice that could contribute to this notion of a restorative justice discourse. And throughout my program of research, I've been keenly interested in how communities define terms that are used in the context of their work. And I found that when adult facilitators and youth participants share a discourse that is central to their objectives, there is an opportunity for expansive learning. My first request was asking student circle keepers to define justice and to define restorative justice. And this provided meaningful insight. As student circle keepers began to define justice, they relied on words like wrong, the right way, getting something solved, and one student even posited, with justice, you just feel like it's something in print. When defining restorative justice, circle keep, student circle keepers use words like building, making, lifting, fixing, resolving, demonstrating that restorative justice was a process as opposed to something in print, in which youth participants were civic actors charged with responsibility to care for those who were harmed as well as those who caused harm. Restorative justice had a certain level of pliability and space for interpretation in these definitions. According to student circle keepers, both sides could engage in a process of making things right. Youth seemed to understand that in any conflict there were multiple perspectives, and I want to start with this quote by uh, Viola. Restorative justice is making wrongs right, but making it right in a way that both sides can come to an agreement. Because there's some justice where it's just like, I feel like this is justice, but the other person may not agree. Restorative justice is like you're restoring an issue, and it's justice on both sides. That's the title of this talk. And they've come to that agreement, and that is what's going to happen. Uh, this last six months, I've been working with a team of restorative justice attorneys through my fellowship, um, Sujatha Baliga and her colleagues at Impact Justice. And I, I gave um, 
a, a presentation to them and I, we sh I shared this quote with them and they all agreed like this was the best definition they had ever seen of restorative justice. They've been doing this work. I mean, they've been doing this work in the criminal and juvenile justice context. And this notion of justice being on both sides really stood out for all of us. Student circle keepers at JFK facilitated various types of circles. However, most of the circles were focused on conflict. There still seemed to be a binary uh, in the way that student circle keepers viewed this work and that there was a conflict between two people. And in this view, there was not much consideration for an expansive notion of stakeholders found in restorative justice theory. The pervasiveness of this perspective could be due to the fact that the students were really asked to come in in times of conflict. And I think it's really interesting. There, there are a lot of tensions in the restorative justice practitioner community that schools are using restorative justice to quote unquote triage acute pain. So they're asking people to come in after some of the damage has already been done. So the schools have already been suspending, they've already been isolating, they've already been expelling. And now they want to bring in restorative justice, but some of that damage is already there from years and years of the practice of isolation. And so they're really concerned about restorative justice now being seen as another rung on the discipline ladder by students. So students aren't seeing it as the, having the capacity for community building, so getting ahead of the train, so to speak. So one student said, in restorative justice, we're building that relationship back together between two people, just basically putting it back together. And I don't know how to say this. It's like, it's like making the problem go away. So you can just drop it and be like, OK, that was silly. You know there's no reason to be fighting over something like this. We can totally be friends, end of quote. Some circle keepers instinctively discuss justice and restorative justice together. For example, a student, Jesse, depicted justice as dealing with the individual who experienced harm or who would, uh, what he said, was knocked down already, with justice functioning as a way to, quote, put them back on their feet, end of quote. Advocates for restorative justice argue that the current criminal justice system does not put people who experience harm back on their feet, as Jesse suggested. Victims often wait for long periods of time for court hearings and trials and are not always kept abreast of how these cases are unfolding. Many of their questions go unanswered, and Jesse understood justice to be singular, victim-centered, while restorative justice considered the larger community. Jesse elaborated about this idea of restorative justice striving for more balance among stakeholders, and I'm quoting him again here. I think there's kind of like two justices. Like, you're in court, and that's more like forced justice. And then there's restorative justice where everybody's doing it voluntarily. Because you can just sentence somebody to suspension, to volunteer services, and just hope that they get it, and just hope that it clicks in their head. But restorative justice means you're going to talk about it and talk it out, and we're not going to leave until everybody understands what went wrong, or at least until everybody gets it off their chest in a safe space. While Jesse described restorative justice circles as safe spaces, practitioners are starting to trouble the notion of safety as the field grows. At the fifth national conference on community and restorative justice in Fort Lauderdale, Florida this past June, there were myriad discussions about the role of circle keepers and the ethics of the practice. Some asked whether or not practitioners were perpetuating biases and binaries that initially distinguished restorative justice from other ways of engaging harm. I think that's a really important question to take up. Another student circle keeper compared her definitions of justice prior to her restorative justice training and after her training. And Carrie said, before I kind of thought justice was you did something wrong and something wrong should be done to you. If you do something wrong, you go to jail. I was really stuck on that. You do something wrong, that's what you should do. You should go to jail and you should have time to think about it. And that's the reason you go to jail. But then I came here and I started getting into restorative justice and I started thinking, there's a lot of things that's behind it. Not all people deserve to go to jail. Some people do need counseling, but for certain crimes, they always get sent there. Or a lot of times they get sent there and sometimes a little bit of counseling and connecting could probably fix whatever was damaged to make them do the crime. But since we don't have enough of that in the justice system, it will continue to be jail all the time. So that's kind of changing, she said. Carrie's view of justice was straightforward and simple. You do something wrong, you go to jail. The beliefs that undergird this popular view of crime and punishment are embedded of notions of personal responsibility. 
That is a discourse that permeates our culture as Americans. And Carrie, like most Americans, was quote unquote, stuck on that. However, the paradigm shift to thinking restorative, restoratively requires considering context, or as Carrie offered, to learn what is behind the actions. Through circle keeping, which by no means, I want to be clear, is, uh, is formal counseling. That's not what circle keeping is. There was time for what she considered to be a little bit of counseling and most importantly, connecting. Carrie learned that the actions of those who caused harm could be addressed and in some cases disrupted. The notion of interconnectedness is currently being examined in restorative justice theory. Civil rights attorney and executive director of restorative justice for Oakland youth, our joy, Fanya Davis, argues that when the quote unquote web of interrelatedness is disrupted, it is possible to restore this through restorative justice practices. And Fanya Davis argues that the United States should engage in a truth and reconciliation process using restorative justice to address the systematic violence against black people. Restorative justice in this context would seek to, and I'm quoting her here, repair the harm caused to the whole of the web, restoring relationships to move into a brighter future, end of quote. Carrie approached the restorative justice process as if it were a puzzle. I feel as if your problem is being restored. It's going from being a problem to just a situation. It's not as big. It's not holding you down. It's no longer a chip on your, so your shoulder. It's just something in front of you, a jigsaw puzzle that you just have to figure out. And it helps the situation to know that it's not as bad as it really is. It's not as bad as you may think. And it helps you resolve it. And that's kind of the restorative part of it. And I think that's so important because what these students are understanding that sometimes the adults in the building don't understand is we want to give young people the opportunity to get up from under these labels. And currently, there's nothing to really get them up from under these labels. Once their um, you know, uh, typecast is low achieving or dis you know, disruption to the school or problem makers, once they're under that label, it's really hard to get from under that. And so what the restorative justice circle processes offer is a, is a way for them to get from under those labels that hold them down. And you're not just this one thing that you did. You're so much more than this one thing that you did. And until we sort of get to that, the kids are going to be continuously punished for the one thing that they did. Similarly, Carrie viewed justice in the context of restorative justice as a process that involved problem solving. And she explained, I feel like justice is just getting something solved. For example, if a teacher and a student aren't getting along and the grade isn't going as well as the student wants it to, and they're having trouble and they can't communicate with the teacher, the student would come in a circle and they would talk about it instead of not talking about it. And if the student gets, is getting a referral or something like that, then they can talk about it and improve the conflict. Carrie underscored that everybody or everyone who was involved in the incident or disruption is also respo responsible for co-creating an action plan to make things right. Here, Carrie began to unpack one of the themes I saw in conversations with student circle keepers. Student circle keepers considered restorative justice to be the only space in schools where students could address their teachers without fear of retaliation. The only space. Another student circle keeper described the circle as offering options to those involved. Basically, justice is like everything's going right, like the right way, what's supposed to be. You feel like it's in print, like it's good, like everything's good. And restorative justice is letting the students know all their options and ways to solve situations, and basically like being honest and truthful in the circles. And I would describe it as something that helps students see another student's perspectives. One of the challenges in building a restorative justice discourse in school is that restorative justice practices occupy spaces that continue to use punitive discourses. Having other systems in place, of course, makes community members feel safer. My colleague uh, and scholar, at prison abolitionist Erica Miners in 2007 began to address this in her groundbreaking book, Right to be Hostile, Schools, Prisons, and the Making of Public Enemies. When asked about her views as a prison abolitionist, Miners was often confronted with the question, but what are we going to do with the really bad people? If suspending children is a tool, it will be used. If expelling children is an option, it will be exercised. If calling armed police to remove a child from the classroom is part of a school's culture, then it will be practiced. If jails for children and adults exist, they will be filled which begs the question, how can there truly be a paradigm shift if these mechanisms are in place?
my five-year-old son, Obasi, he came up to me just a few weeks ago and he said, Mommy, are there still prisons? <laughs> and I laughed. I said, oh gosh, maybe I'm talking about my work too much. And um, I said, yes, there are still prisons. And he said, he asked me, aren't they old fashioned? You know, he just he just sees them as something that's like the, like a land far, far away, like where we like put people away. And I said, you know, that's how a lot of people feel, like they're a little bit old fashioned. And of course, restorative case conferences are replacing, um, there's a lot of court diversion programs that are happening. Um, I was able to see the power and potential in that. Um, Community Works West is an organization that works with the Alameda County DA. Uh, to do court diversion for youth. Um, countries such as New Zealand, New Zealand has um, rid themselves of detention centers. They use a restorative justice case conference process with their young people. Northern Ireland, which was the um, site for the European Forum for Restorative Justice last year, uh, our conference opened up with the Minister of Justice from Northern Ireland. And, now every single youth who is involved in causing harm has to have a restorative case conference proceeding as opposed to just a traditional court proceeding. So people are doing this work. They are changing the paradigm by shifting the system and not making these other things a possibility or an option. At JFK, youth court, I know some of you have heard of youth court, youth court seemed to function as insurance for restorative justice circle processes. It was viewed as more systematic, structured and having clear and concise steps to follow up with stakeholders. Prior to my research in communities practicing restorative justice, I have to admit I was skeptical of youth court coexisting with restorative justice. I wondered how a community in the early phases of implementing restorative justice could be committed to this change in mindset if there was still the language of youth court in the same building. So for example, youth court you know, still uses judge and sentence and that sort of thing. I wanted to know which students were asked to judge, how they were selected, and how that hierarchy and power dynamic among students impacted their perceptions of each other and shaped their relationship outside of the court. Youth court maintained um, the retributive discourse using words like jury and sentencing, but in listening and learning from student circle keepers, I discovered that they did not find the relationship between restorative justice and youth court to be as dichotomous as I thought, so I stand corrected on that. Several circle keepers participated in both restorative justice and youth court, and they used the former to inform their decisions and the latter to make them more restorative. Student circle keepers valued the, their restorative justice training in the context of youth court while acknowledging that there was a difference. One student shared, I believe that youth court kind of falls in the line of a regular court. It's not necessarily a punishment, but it's basically a punishment, I believe, but it's not maximum punishment. It's not the most you can punish. So I would say justice is basically, basically just getting back what you put out there. I believe the biggest part of restorative justice is to restore, because instead of getting back what you deserve in the maybe negative way, if you put negativity out there, restoring kind of fills the emptiness of whatever you pulled out. So kind of restoring that punishment instead of doing a punishment. Doing a more intimate circle and realizing why you've done what you've done. Another student, Jesse, said, the way I kind of look at restorative justice is that it does a lot of the smaller stuff and youth court is more like the bigger stuff. A lot of youth court cases come from different places, fights. And also everybody has the opportunity to explore those just not everybody has the opportunity to explore those justice circles and the only way you benefit from the circle is if the person wants to be in the circle. So it's all participatory and voluntary. You have to say that you want to be and participate in this process. And then youth court is like our next best thing to try to help them out. And youth court is not the greatest, but I have. I, we will sentence them to some kind of community service. I've even done it where kids just aren't connected to the school, so we sentence them to try new clubs or something like that. So it's just kind of, it's kind of we get to ask them questions, kind of that's really how we go about it. We ask them questions about how their life is and the overall sense of how a person is, and then it helps. Also, I learned that equality really matters to the young people, the student circle keepers who are doing this work. One of the questions that I asked the focus group was, who is restorative justice for? And who is or what is actually being restored? I explained that I didn't have the answers to these questions but was learning from their experiences as circle keepers. 
The first student who responded to this set of questions set the tone by naming that there was a quote unquote power dynamic between students and teachers, quote, that often makes them feel like they are less. Students in the focus group argued that restorative justice circles, in restorative justice circles, teachers and students are on quote unquote equal ground. One student said, I kind of feel like because restorative justice is a program that mends broken relationships, it's like when you come into restorative justice, everybody has that equal ground. The teacher is not looked at as the teacher, and the student is not looked at as the student. Everybody needs to be respected, and everybody needs to have that equality. So the teacher can say how he or she feels without the student being too offended. The student can say how they feel without having the idea or threat and feeling that they might not be suspended. The circle is the space where everybody is respected and everybody can share exactly how they feel. Students accepted, seem to have accepted the fact that they could not expect or feel or expect to be or feel respected if fixed identities of teacher and student remained in place. Those real and imagined titles impeded relationships and opportunities for clear communication, goal setting, and establishing shared values. If these are not in place, there will be many students who will not learn in these contexts. In that regard, the notion of equality becomes central in many student circle keepers' responses. Other student circle keepers um, underscored that this notion of equality, uh, underscored this notion of, of equality as they attempted to capture the role of restorative justice in their school community. And one student said, that's really what restorative justice is to me. It's a community and it helps bring us together. It's where everybody's equal and sometimes we don't feel like everybody's equal here, especially while we're in the circle. We always say that everybody's equal because it's really hard if you're in conflict or you're having trouble with a teacher and you always feel that the teacher's gonna win the argument because they're upper. I love this word, upper, they're upper. They're upper in standards because they're the teacher. I mean, they're older, they know better, but we always tell them in circle that everybody's equal and it really helps most kids, most kids talk it out and figure stuff out because they don't always feel like they can accomplish anything because the teacher will always be above. While students offered a compelling vision for equality that required both students and teachers to redefine their roles in learning communities, I wondered if the adults in the building shared the same vision of equality and democratic engagement. Eight weeks into the 2014-2015 academic year, the district that housed JFK implemented this new discipline program emphasizing restorative justice practices. The plan was described by classroom teachers, this is just eight weeks in, as quote unquote, not working. <laughs> One middle school teacher asserted, the theory does not match the reality. Seven months later, a teacher granted an interview with a local paper in which she declared the new discipline policy problems, quote, forced her to resign, end of quote. The main issue, according to this teacher, was before the new discipline plan, she could call support staff to quote unquote intervene when there was a quote unquote out of control student. And then she said, we call now and no one comes. And the teacher said this before declaring, this is basically bad parenting 101. It was evident to student circle keepers that restorative justice circles offered a space in which students and teachers in conflict could talk to each other without, the, without looming punishment. But because JFK actually had very few teachers who re completed restorative justice training, it was unclear during my time there as a participant observer if the teachers really shared the same view. There was just an article in, in the Los Angeles Times talking about the difficulties and the tensions in getting restorative justice on its feet. And one of the problems is that teachers, again, are not being given the tools. They are not actually being properly trained. And to do proper training, a lot of the practitioners who I work with, they won't even have a conversation with people who will not give them three to four days of training. You need training, they need nourishment, and they need to be compensated for their time, um, which is one of the reasons why I really would like to see us do this work in teacher preparation. It's a time where we have our pre-service teachers with us. It's before they get into, I forgot one of our colleagues said, the noise of, of school. I think Gloria said that today, the noise of when you're a teacher and there's all this other stuff coming at you. So how can we do this work before our teachers are in the noise of their first year of teaching? This is really, really hard work. Um, is Principal Adolfson here from San Juan? Did she, is she here? Um, 
uh, Principal Adolfson and her team from San Juan Unified School District um, are implementing, implementing restorative justice, and they're doing some work in Sacramento City Unified School District. But what I think is really important about what they're doing at San Juan High School is they're also implementing an ethnic studies course. And I think there's, there's just so much focus on dismantling systems of oppression and re using restorative justice to reduce racial disparities in the discipline gap and the education debt. But we also have to build institutions that seek to liberate our children and teachers from racist and classist pedagogies and practices. So we can't just keep dismantling. We've got to build something in its place. Where do we go to? We're taking these things away, but what are we putting in its place? What tools are we giving our teachers and our staff persons and everybody who's working with the children? And I do want to say that I consider everybody in the building with the children to be their teachers. That is a model from independent black institutions. Everyone who has an exchange with the children in the building, who's in the cafeteria, who's cleaning up the building, these are all the teachers. They are all imparting some kind of value on the children. I want to challenge us to think about living outside the circle as well. How can we use this paradigm shift and its processes to make the wrongdoings of the education debt right? And how can, we, how can teachers and teacher educators become what my friend and colleague Sujatha Baliga calls paradigm shift communicators? As a researcher, there are moments when I find myself returning to other spaces I've occupied as a participant observer and in best cases, a worthy witness in communities who have generously shared their spaces with me. Working with student circle keepers at JFK was one of these moments. Young people are actively searching for the right words, their own words to describe their experiences, their perspectives, their worldview, and themselves. Young people are searching for these words in spite of being at the whim of an infrastructure that wields the power to assert definitions and descriptions that often render these children as unworthy and undeserving of citizenship. When I conducted my dissertation research nearly 15 years ago in black-owned and operated bookstores and poetry venues, I interviewed over 100 poets, writers, and audience members who frequented these spaces. An unexpected finding was how many African American parents I met who used these spaces as both supplementary and alternative knowledge spaces for their children. One of the parents, quotes, will always stay with me, Mrs. Shabazz, who explains the process of trying to find the right word for her children who are African American, who she did not believe would receive the right word at school. And I'm quoting her here. That's what we are, Maisha. Words make people. Those are the images that create us. So if you got the word lazy or you got the word beautiful, that helps you form your identity in yourself. What else can we do but pay homage to the word and the right word? Because the wrong word creates false people. So if we're looking for the right word for our children because we've had the wrong word. Restorative justice circle processes are possible sites for change, changing language and thus transforming lives. My colleagues in psychology have found that children with a strong sense of family narrative and often experience affirming social interaction and acquire skillful language development. Ultimately, I would like to create a model for restorative justice circle processes for teacher education whereby participants, both students and teachers, have an opportunity to retell their narratives choosing words and language that challenge monolithic narratives that potentially limit how others view them and how they view themselves. This opportunity for what we're calling restoring or retelling one story seems particularly urgent at this critical intersection of America's relationships with its, relationship with its citizens. In these circles or change labs, I think we may be able to begin the difficult work of addressing race class, gender, religion, privilege, and inequality. Thank you. You didn't know you had two new students in the School of Ed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they need some honoraries. <laughs> They've been listening to mommy's work for too long. <laughs> Step from behind. Can I sit? Oh, no, I can't. Sorry. Oh. What role does learning disabilities play in restorative justice? Because I know that there's a significant link between people with learning disabilities and people who are in the prison system. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Sorry, I'll go That's okay. I'll Which, talk. What role does dealing with learning disabilities play in restorative justice? There seems to be a very strong link 
and people with learning disabilities? Yes. Absolutely. I think that's that's a really critical question right now. So the question was, what is the role of restorative justice in supporting students with learning disabilities? I mean, what we know now is that students with disabilities are being suspended at astounding rates. I mean, it's it, it should be embarrassing, actually. I feel really embarrassed by it. Um, and so one of the things that restorative justice see is seeking to do to disrupt that cycle of constantly punishing students who are... Um, uh, you know, who have learning disabilities. And um, I think that, you know, there's, there, there's this chasm, right? Like there's the students who are really for this and then there's the administrators. The administrators want to get those numbers down, right? They, they are very invested in trying to make sure that these disparities are, are cut at their schools. But then the teachers are caught somewhere in the middle, right? Because they're not um, they're not really getting the tools that they need to really do the work in really thoughtful, powerful ways. I mean, if you talk to a restorative justice practitioner who will say, we need three full days, not, and I mean days where you're fully present in a room. My first restorative justice training, we were in a room, we were in circle for three days. We ate in there, we talked to each other, you're not supposed to be on your cell phone, there's no laptops out, there's, you are there, you're fully present. That's the kind of work that it takes. And so one of the things that I thought was really interesting when, when I hosted a restorative justice um, training at UW-Madison is we had special education teachers who were there who found the restorative justice circle process a really powerful way to engage the young people that they were working with and they really, really wanted their colleagues to have this experience too because they were often the ones who were, people will come get them like, oh, so-and-so is not, they're, they're doing something, I need your help. So they, people weren't taking the time to find out what things that they could do with these students. They're relying on the special education staff members or people who are designated special education. But I think what restorative de justice does, it sort of democratizes, if you will, the relationship. So it's not just the people who are in special ed or the social workers at the school or the psychologists in the school who are expected to do the heavy lifting of building their relationships, but it, it actually offers a tool that everyone can be engaged in where you don't have to seek out individual or specific people, but everyone is doing it in an ideal situation, of course. Thank you for that question. Yes? To what degree do we involve parents? <laughs> Yeah, that's great. That question came up with faculty today, right? Um, so um, typically in a restorative justice uh, circle, depending on, there's circles of support that might be just for one particular student who's having some struggles. They're not necessarily about conflict all the time. And circles of support, uh, the student who was the, you know, the focal point of the, of the circle, um, they get to choose advocates to come in for them. And a lot of times the advocates are parents or guardians. Um, for those of you who have never seen what a circle looks like, Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth, Our Joy, has some beautiful videos that are up on their website. That's Our Joy, Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth. And I was just referencing this to um, my colleagues in the School of Ed here today. There is a beautiful uh, video of a reentry circle where you have a young man who's coming back to school after having some experiences with being suspended. His mother is in the circle. His stepfather is in the circle. There are teachers from all the content areas, you know, all the periods periods of the day, uh, the principal is there, and one of the questions is not only what would the student need to be able to be successful, but what kind of support did his mother need? You know, what kind of things did she need to be successful with him? And it was, it's really powerful. So parents are definitely a huge part of this. They're asked to come in if it's, you know, if it seems relevant or some sort of advocate or ally of not only the person who was harmed, but the person who caused harm. Everyone's supposed to have an advocate or ally in the circle. Thanks for asking that question. Yes? You talked a little bit about how, you know, we often think that restorative justice is often for the brown kids. Yeah. And that's not always true. It's also for um, the students with learning disabilities. It's for queer uh, students, yeah. for female yeah. students. It's for everybody. How do we, as a credential candidate, I know that I'm, I may not be in Oakland where it's very clear that the need is there. I may be at a predominantly white middle class school. Mm -hmm. How do I bring restorative justice mm -hmm. to that school? How do I make that case to parents who say, like, my girl's white and Jewish. Like, I don't think she needs it. Like, how do I make them see that? <laughs> <laughs> she, yeah, yeah, she. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I know, it's <laughs> 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 
Right. Well, it's interesting because we, we came across these questions when I was doing the work with the power riders in the Bronx. So I was working with a, a, a team of incredible teachers, one primary teacher, Joseph Ubilace, who worked at University Heights High School in the Bronx that primarily served Puerto Rican, Dominican, West Indian, and African American youth. Um, what was really interesting is uh, there was an opportunity to do the work at a private prep school um, that's also in the Bronx. And at first people thought, well, do they really need the power writing model, which is a model where students are exchanging original writing, giving each other feedback in a process called read and feed. Um, what was incredible was this amazing exchange that happened with the students at, at, the, at this public sort of under-resourced school and this private prep school, how much how, how important it was that the students at the private prep school who had other kinds of privileges, they're experiencing the same angst. I mean, it's like youth angst, right? It's like the stuff that everybody goes through that's universal, that really um, transcends any sort of physical boundaries that we think we're seeing, right? And so a lot of the work that they did in power writing, they did. They ended up taking it to schools out in Long Island and schools that served lots of different kinds of young people. Um, and I think the same thing can be said for restorative justice work. What's really interesting is at JFK, now you see people using circles of support. There was a, a suicide attempt with a student. You know, This was a white student, and the group of friends were just completely traumatized that this happened. And so what the parents saw was that their children really needed these to be in these circles of support because once they experienced that with their friend, it was really impacting their experiences at the school. It was impacting their emotions at the school, and they needed a place to sort of think through this. But I do, I, I, I really, I caution against this because I think it's so important that all of these programs are, or any kind of thing that we're bringing in that we're thinking about, it's not, it is not just for the color kids. <laughs> it's not just for the kids over there. And one of the things that I think is really important in thinking about restorative justice, um, and I talked about this earlier today, Tanisi Coates has this beautiful article in The Atlantic called The Black Family in the Age of Mass Incarceration, where he traces black criminality and talks about, um, <laughs> Um, this country's efforts to really criminalize black people, you know, beginning with enslavement and continuing with Jim Crow. And then he really uses the, the Moynihan Report in 1965 that um, really talks about the black family or the Negro family at the time in uh, really pathologizing ways. And he, he says that we are all really impacted by the criminality of black people. We don't really understand how much we are, including black people. Um, and that for blacks who have not been you know, entangled in the justice system at all, they are still victims of this black criminalization, this notion of black criminalization. And so I think it's really important that everybody gets in the circle so that we can unpack what these narratives are. I started to talk about this at the end of the talk. One of the things that I'd really like to, to do, and this really comes from being inspired in, actually in Northern Ireland, there are people who do restorative justice work who have a narrative approach. The University of Ulster there actually offers like graduate programs in restorative justice, and they have a narrative approach where they're really interested in giving young people an opportunity to tell these stories. And when I think about some of the work that's being done in the US, in psychology around family narratives, most of that work has been done with middle class white children. A lot of that work hasn't been done in sort of mixed um, groups, mixed age groups and ethnicity, um, you know, gender orientation. So I'd like for us to think about some of those models about what do we mean to create a family narrative or retell the narrative from your perspective and, and reclaim that and use the right words. Use the words that you want to use to describe who you are. And um, one of the other things that I want to share uh, is that I, I learned from the student circle keepers at JFK, or I relearned, I should say, how really important the hallways are in high school, right? The hallways are this huge, like, place where you know who's who, you know who's popular, who's coming down the hallway high-fiving everybody, you know who's kind of trying to squeak by quietly and not get pushed and shoved, you see who speaks, who has people to speak to, who doesn't, and one of the things that the student circle keeper said about being in the circle is now suddenly they have this reference point for people who they thought they would never have anything to say, anything to, for any reason. They already judged these people and they made assumptions about them. But in the circle, they found out these are th this person is really okay. They have their story. Maybe we have some things in common. Maybe we don't. But they are a human being. 
And so then all of a sudden, they see this person in the hallway, this <laughs> social institution in itself, and they have a relationship. They can say hello, they can connect, they can build, they say, how are you? They check on them, are, are things going okay? In a way that they had not even dared to do before. Yes? different ages. I know um, you were talking a lot more about adolescence. Yes. But do we see this sort of thing being affected in younger grades? Is, does it have to be modified some way, like appropriateness? I know I can't speak to the What I can speak to is that there are people being trained at the elementary school level. So um, in West Contra Costa uh, County School District, uh, Catholic Charities is partnering with West Contra Costa County Schools. And I, one of the trainings that I went to during part of my fellowship was actually at an elementary school in Richmond, where they were training um, elementary school teachers, kindergarten through fifth grade, in restorative justice trauma-informed practices. Um, I was telling my colleagues earlier, I, I never had trauma training in all my teacher preparation. I had awesome, I believe, awesome teacher preparation. I didn't really know anything about the trauma literature. So they're bringing the restorative justice work and trauma-informed work together. And yeah, so they're doing trainings as early as, as elementary school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I come from a human development perspective, but has there been any work looking at whether or not restorative justice sort of changes the sort of stages of moral development? That's really interesting because there's a lot of talk about emotional intelligence and how right. important that is for children. Matter of fact, I think the New York Times just did this article about emotional intelligence and elementary ed. Um, I yeah. Seen any work. It, any well, I think the. I mean, this is a whole body of work that is untapped, and I think that we have a lot of really powerful work in the legal field around restorative justice, and we're just now starting to see work in restorative justice in education. Um, but a lot of um, the restorative justice, justice in education work are sort of case studies about different um, schools and kind of. A little more how-to-ish, like if you want to do this at your school, these are kind of the steps. And I think that's really important, but not as much work thinking about the theory, taking in theories of human development. I think that these are some of the really rich places where if we have students who want to start, you know, having a line of inquiry in this area, this is really a fertile space. Yeah. You know. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Anybody? Hi. Hi. Um, so. My question is that like with youth who have been experienced or who have experienced years of punitive practice and therefore disengagement and isolation from the institution, um, I can't imagine that they'd be too eager to participate in something like mm -hmm. this. So in your time with Girl Time or with in, at JFK, um, what, have, what has sort of been done with students like that who are really hesitant to participate, but you think could benefit from something like restorative justice I process? Can, that's such a great question. I, you cannot imagine how many students are actually a little bit relieved that someone is going to listen to them. It's incredible. So a lot of the students who are causing the most noise and the most commotion are actually really interested in this process. And it's not because they just don't want to get suspended again. Because guess what? Getting suspended is easy, people. Like, people, I keep hearing people say, this is the thing that I do not agree with. I keep hearing people say that restorative justice doesn't hold students accountable. But suspending kids and having them home on social media all day is not holding them accountable. It's just not. I mean, you know, who doesn't want to be like this all day, right? You know, we get into our little worlds or on Instagram and Facebook, what, you know, whatever. Um, so one of the things that I think is really powerful is how many of the students really want a space to talk. No one's really ever asked them why they do what they do. They've never asked themselves. They've never had the opportunity. When you're constantly isolated, right, if you're constantly removed, removal and isolation do not force you to talk about what's going on. That's why you have repeat behaviors. That's why you have people continuing to do the same thing. And not only that, but something that the student circle keepers understood that, you know, not even all the adults in the building understood was that they're like, you know, I see my peers and they know the teacher's triggers. And they want to leave. They want to get kicked out. And they know exactly what to do. And we're all like, mm, it's 2.10. So-and-so is getting ready to do such. Like, they already know what's going to happen before the teacher knows. They know it. They see it played out every single day. And so they know this. We need to get on 
board and try to figure it out. But the, the students know this. And so I think it's really interesting if we think about if you've had a history of removal and isolation that has impacted your ability to read, your ability to do the math, do the science, and you know that if you are kicked out, you do not have to confront the fact that you are really, really behind. Then you're just going to keep producing activities and behaviors that get you sent out. Then you don't have to confront that very, very hard work that you may be really, really behind. That's hard. So um, at, during my time at JFK, I've actually been with student circle keepers who talk to students and ask them if they want to be in the, in the process. And even some of the most reluctant students, they'll give it a try. And if uh, the right person at the school asks them to, that's why you need so many people in the building who are trained, the right kinds of allies. There's always that one person who can say, hey, why don't you give this a try? A lot of times at this school, it's a student engagement coordinator or a social worker. And then they'll try it. And then they're there. So once they get, once they get them, they, they, don't go, they can't go back. <laughs> I just wanted to add just one little thing. We do have a number of folks in the room who are um, learning to be teachers right now. Yeah. And um, it sounds as if there are a number of principles from restorative justice education that might be valuable even in the sort of short term. Are, are there a few, maybe what I mean to say is um, some folks here might think, well, this would be great if I had those three days of training, but I, but I don't. What can I use from this? What might be a couple of principles in that moment when I'm in the classroom and something like that, oh, oh it's 210, here comes one of those kind of <laughs> scenes again. You know, I don't know, do you have a couple of thoughts like that about what I, they I might do, do with that? I do. I have some thoughts about it, but I do want to say that I have to, I really do side with the practitioners when I say that you need proper training. I really do believe that. After having experienced the training myself, having been in multiple trainings, I know that you need the training. You actually need to experience it. And anyone in the building advocating for it needs to have the training. But one of the thing, one of the, the tools that I've seen has worked really well for teachers who have had some success is that they start circling their students up right away in the school year so that when things happen along the way, they're able to come back to this very deliberate system to deal with conflict. So there are a lot of teachers who teach some of their materials in the circle. They'll either take an article or an op-ed or something that is related to a theme and the books that they're reading, and they'll just do that work in the circle so that the students are actually comfortable in the structure. And I learned this from some teachers who, like, when they had a conflict and they tried to get students in the circle, but they didn't, they didn't have a culture for it in the classroom, it was awkward. It was awkward for the teacher. It was awkward for the students. They're like, what are you doing? Like, you know, it's like, it's February, and you're asking us to sit in a circle. We haven't been doing this all year. But when they started doing it early on, maybe before there were larger issues then and they when they needed it as a tool later they could they could actually do it because the students had a framework for it as opposed to why are you doing this you haven't been doing this so um, I just want to uh, I'm Harold Levine I'm doing the School of Education and I want to thank Dr. Lynn for giving us a, more than a day of her value <laughs> Uh, there are so many things that are in my head that are you know, stimulated from what you've talked about today. And certainly, um, the issues that around uh, justice and around uh, citizenship and uh, liberty and democratization don't stop when students end at high school. Mm -hmm. We deal with some great issues here at the university, That's right. as I'm sure you do at Wisconsin. And I think issues around the restorative justice probably has been, but we'd like to learn more about how it's explored at the university. Mm -hmm. um, um, I also, um, I was really struck by how you started the, your, your talk, really about the Pledge of Allegiance mm -hmm. and liberty and justice for all. Um, and also, one of the participants in one of your studies you quoted, uh, we always think about, I think, as, as people making words. Mm -hmm. I think it was she who was, that words make people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's right. And it forces us to, to use your word to interrogate these things. Yeah. And the, 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 with liberty and justice for all, I think we do need to interrogate. And maybe we need to redefine it as with liberty and restorative justice for all. Mm -hmm. um, I like that. We, uh, <laughs> We deeply appreciate you coming. Uh, you it's so been much. marvelous. I know all of us have appreciated it. And one last thank thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you guys.